We're back on the NPH Hour on News Talk Saga 960 AM. I'm your host, Jason Tong. Small towns in Atlantic Canada are mostly known for their hockey players, and with that sport's head start in this country, players from tiny villages are found consistently. And that is starting to change on the basketball side as well. With the growth of the basketball industry in Canada, it is getting easier to get found no matter where you are from. Key Van Vino is a prime example. From a village of about 1,200 people in Nova Scotia, he was able to stay home, and thanks to the CEBL's commitment to including current youth sports players on their rosters, he is getting an opportunity that is almost unheard of for post-secondary players, and he is definitely making the most of his first year in the pros. Key Van Vino, Hamilton Honey Badgers, and Dalhousie University guard proudly representing a new wave of ballers coming out of Atlantic Canada. The first thing I want to know, Key Van, tell me about your hometown of Port Williams, Nova Scotia, a population of just under 1,200. What can you share about your village? Uh, Port Williams, super small area. It's, it's right next to Wolfville. It's, once you cross the river, there's a bridge that brings you right into Port Williams. There's one stretch of the old highway that Port Williams consists of. Uh, aside from that, there's some subdivisions and lots of land. It's, it's known widely for agriculture and apples and farms. And uh, it's a nice little spot that I like to call home. It's beautiful. And, and where did you grow up playing basketball there? Then you mentioned Wolfville, Wolfville and, and that was Horton High School, I would guess. But, but maybe even younger than that, like how did you get introduced to the game and, and where did you play it? Uh, mom and dad started a basketball program in Fort Williams when I was super young. She, or mom and dad started it for, um, my older sister's age, which was five at the time. So there was a bunch of people around her age that were playing basketball and my twin sister and I, Jada were three. And so we would just come along because why well, get a babysitter when we could just be in the gym with them. So we, we started off playing basketball at a young age at the elementary school, which is I'm sure if I was there now, I could stand on one baseline and shoot a jump shot to the other end. It was maybe a half size of a basketball court, but we played there until we were in grade six. But aside from that, all of my basketball was just at a young age was out in the driveway because we didn't really have access to any, any gyms or anything. So it was just basketball for me was just shooting hoops in the driveway. Well, so let's talk about your sisters then. I didn't, I didn't know you had a twin sister as well. So, so let's just talk about maybe their, their love for the game of basketball. What are they doing with it right now? For sure. Uh, older sister, Jenica, she played basketball up until grade 12. She was a, she was a post, she had a really good mid range jump shot. But once she got to the decision where she had to go to university, she stopped playing basketball and started studying neuroscience. So she's now writing a PhD, which is, just a different beast in general. And my twin sister, Jada, obviously the same age, she's playing at Acadia right now, which is like the neighboring town. And uh, she's also, she's a very good basketball player. She's, uh, she was, uh, I think, second or first team all-star in her second year. She's been battling some injuries. And uh, so it's, I guess it, it is a basketball family. Absolutely. Except for that, you know, that wild card neuroscience, eh? Like who, who would want to take that when you could dribble a basketball? <laughs> what a dummy. <laughs> exactly. Right. Now, I, I mentioned you're a part of the new wave of ballers. And if, if people were paying attention, they would have seen this coming because back in 2015, Nova Scotia swept the Canadian nationals on the boys side, both U15 and U17 age groups. And I know you didn't play a lot. You were the youngest player on that U17 team, but what did you take away from that experience? You know, really being a part of something bigger than yourself, sacrificing maybe your own personal advances uh, to, to be a part of, of such a great team. Uh, it was a tough summer for me because I was used to being in such a small area. I was used to being like the guy on the team. And so when it came to like summer basketball, I wasn't very well known around the province at a young age. And I was decently well known at that time. But um, I think in the finals, I didn't get off the bench which, you know, in the moment, frustrating. I wanted to play, as did everyone. But I think the biggest takeaway from that summer is uh, learning championship culture and as well as that you can affect the team, like, no matter what your rotation is. If you're first off the bench, if you're a starter, or if you just don't play at all, you can still practice hard, do as much as you can, lay up lines, or just bring energy from the bench the whole game. Oh, what do you remember from the gold medal game since you had a really good seat for it? Um, but, you know, but, but the atmosphere was awesome. It was in Halifax. Uh, you had a guy on your squad that 
made the NBA and had a pretty good championship game. And you beat an Ontario team that also had a guy that has done some pretty big things as well in the NBA. Yeah, it was, uh, it was probably one of the coolest games that I've ever been a part of. And, you know, maybe it's me being naive, but I'm, I'm glad that I didn't play that game. It was, I think I had more fun sitting and watching and cheering, but uh, I think Nate had 50 that game. Nate Darling is now playing with the, the Charlotte Hornets and uh, Toronto or Ontario had RJ. And I think he was like 15 at the time, but he was a stud and now he's playing for the Knicks and, you know, you know, RJ is a great player. <laughs> Really cool tidbit back in 87 when Nova Scotia last won a gold in a national basketball event. It was your father, Kevin, who was a member of that team. And then you do it all those years later, winning a gold as well. How important was he? You talked about both your parents, but, but you know, your father specifically, you come from a basketball family uh, that really kind of sets the tone early in your life, doesn't it? It does. And it was interesting because I've had dad as my coach basically my entire life. Jenica and Jada had mom as their coach their entire life. They always coached us up until we graduated high school. So um, the growth from them was huge. And with dad coaching me, he would drive me to and from every game. And same thing was, was with, or same was with the sisters. Mom would drive them to and from every game. So we would talk a lot in the car and sleep or whatever. But that summer specifically, dad would always tell me, like leaving Halifax, frustrated, driving back to Port Williams, that he would say, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And so that's been one thing that's been in the back of my mind ever since I was 16 that summer, which I'm now 22. So six years later that, uh, you know, it, it's not right now. It's, it's at the end of the day, what type of basketball player you can be. Do you find that there is a style and maybe not an on-court style, but maybe the type of person that is coming out of the Atlantic provinces and what I've found, it's like, they seem to be hardworking individuals and good teammates is that something that you found as well? And does that come from that kind of small town feel? I, th I think it does. I also think it goes hand in hand with the, the small town or smaller provinces is there's no such thing as an ego. And so like you guys that like could be like the man on their high school team. And then they come to a local university in Nova Scotia and, you know, there's no love lost. Everyone's there for basketball. Everyone there loves the sport. And whether if you're 12th man or you're starting, you know, if you're on the team, then you want to see everyone succeed. You mentioned 12th man and starting. So, so let's get now to current day, the Hamilton Honey Badgers. Take me back maybe for the last 12 months or 12 months plus. You were AUS Male Athlete of the Year. Your, your team in U Sports goes to the championship game and you're followed by a year being wiped out due to the pandemic. But then that's followed up by you getting drafted to the CEBL as a U-sports player. You get into camp. You haven't played really a competitive game outside of the training that you're talking about. Then a few games in, we're calling the game and you get your first start and you just go off. What was that day like for your first professional basketball start? It was, uh, it was an interesting one for sure. We, uh, we were in the gym. I think the game was at seven that night. So we were in there around, I don't know, two or something. And right before we had, we watched film uh, before we'd shoot around coach just like called me aside. And he's like, come walk with me. And I was like, Oh my God, I'm not playing. I don't know why, but I figured I wasn't playing. And then he just asked me how I was. And I was like, good. Like, you know, things are going well. And he's like, okay, good. You're starting. And I just laughed. I was like, just sort of, I was just so thrown off. I was like, what, what do you mean? I'm starting. Why would I, I played seven minutes yesterday. Like, and uh, you just it was, good, it was like, a good seven minutes, though. I just got to put that. It was a good seven minutes <laughs> that you did play the game before. Go ahead. Uh, he just sort of explained that the rotation was tough, and he was trying to find more ways to play me. But uh, it just it's it was challenging to do so. And then he said he just woke up that day and he said, "Screw it, I'll start him." So uh, I got the start. Uh, I didn't tell anyone but my girlfriend. I texted her and I said. Um, make sure you're watching at seven when the game starts. It's just a surprise to, I think to everyone. Cause you know, dad texts me. I think he's like something along the lines of like you bugger, like didn't tell us you were starting. I just, I didn't want to like put that pressure on myself. And so when he told me I was starting and then we had walked through and I was like running through stuff with the starters, he announced to the team, he's like, we got the young boys starting today. And I was just, I was just gassed up. I was all excited. And, uh, you know, playing with guys like Lindell and Trey, like, you know, they do a great job of making me look good. And so 
I think I had 19 that game, but uh, it was just based on being in the right place at the right time with those guys giving me the ball. Yeah. And, and talk about that, that honey badger squad. Cause it really is perfect for you. And, you know, you mentioned head coach Ryan Schmidt and, and GM uh, Jermaine Anderson, both guys that I know really well. And, and, and it's such a great culture around that team. And I mean, even in that game, you miss your first shot. It was a bit of heat check. And, and I saw coach Schmidt pull you over and I was like, I wonder what he's going to say to him. And he like, he shook your hand, like dapped you up and was like, good shot. You know, like, what does that do for a player? And, 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 you know, how special is that, especially for you as a youth sports player? It's uh, it's awesome knowing that no matter what you do, your coach is going to have your back. And so like when I missed that shot, he, the play was for me to get a corner three, but I got the ball and the defense was kind of there. And I was just, like I said, it was kind of heat check. I just like dribbled, stepped back, shot it, missed it. And I think someone got the rebound and went up, got fouled. And he called me over and I, just, I was like, ah, that's just, he's going to read me out. And he called me over and he dapped me up and he's like, way to be aggressive. And it was just like sort of at that point there, like it, it clicked. I was like, this coach gets it. He's like a player's coach, you know, like he's not going to get mad at you for not taking the best shot. So having that moment was pretty cool. And I think it, uh, it was sort of that moment where it was like the pinnacle for like my relationship with him moving forward. You've been a great storyline to follow. And for myself selfishly to be able to call, you know, during the CEVL this season. Uh, but beyond that, it's just going to be amazing to see what you do at U sports with a bunch of other guys. I know, you know, back at your university and, um, you know, I'm looking forward to you making more Canadian basketball history, man. And, and we look forward to seeing what's next. Thank you so much for coming on the MPH Hour. Oh, th thank you. And thank you for all those kind words. Uh, it was awesome to be here. Next on the NPH Hour, we talked to a member of the previous generation of ballers coming out of Nova Scotia, Bryson Johnson, a former Division I basketball player who is now a D1 assistant coach, and he is here to drop some knowledge on some misconceptions on what it takes to succeed in NCAA basketball and why some are better served to not take that pathway at all. It's coming up next here on News Talk Saga, 960 AM.